we're just going to give everyone a chance to kind of come online and join us. So sit tight for just a minute. So we're going to begin punctually at 11 o'clock. Is that the idea? I think that's the idea. Well, okay. What time is it now? 10.59. <laughs> <laughs> Just tuning in now, this is the silent hour on Facebook. We're not this, talking. <laughs> this is a mindfulness moment. <laughs> Are we good? We... I think we're good. I think we're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, hi, everyone. We're glad you could join us today. Uh, we're here live at the Center for Self-Determination Theory uh, in sunny celebration, but it's not so sunny today. It's raining so. cats and dogs out today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I was worried about my outfit <laughs> since I was going to be filmed. Um, so yeah, so we're here with Richard Ryan, and uh, we've got some questions and answers. Hopefully you can provide some answers for us today. Well, this is an experimental show from the Center for Self-Determination Theory. We decided we would uh, play with, try out some new platforms for communicating with the SDT community. And so this is, a, this is really a trial experiment today. We're going to have a question and answer period. And of course, those of you who are listening know we've been soliciting questions this week. We're still having questions that are coming in. Uh, Shannon, I guess you put some of those together and you're going to throw them at me. Is that the case here? <laughs> that is the case. So I hope you're ready to tackle these because yeah. we had actually a lot of questions, a lot of good questions. Um, and because we had such a large amount, I kind of combined them together into categories. So um, we may not get to every specific question, but um, hopefully we're going to get through a lot of them. Yeah. And we're going to spend probably yeah. 45 minutes uh, on this show just so you know uh, when we're likely to end. And um, let's begin. Let's begin. Okay, so here's the first question. Lana and others asked about, SDT says that there are three core needs that we have. So if individuals are in the same conditions, say a classroom or a work office, what are the factors that influence differences in people's needs being met? Hmm, that's a good question, Lana. Um, I, well, first you're right. When we have uh, looked in classrooms or office places, you see a lot of variation within the people who are in those uh, settings in terms of how much they're seeing support for basic psychological needs, for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. So there is a lot of variability in this. Um, so what accounts for that variability? What, what accounts for those individual differences? I, I guess there are two things I'd say about that. First of all, even when people are in the same setting, like children in the same classroom, they're not all being treated the same. I think we all know this from our personal experience. Some people are getting more controlling behavior from the teacher, and some are getting more support for autonomy. In part, they're um, feeding into whether they're in one condition or the other. But it's not that everybody gets the same condition, even when they're in the same setting. But there are also individual differences in how people will perceive even the exact same uh, stimulus coming upon them. And a lot of this has to do with their history. Now, for instance, if you're a child who's come from a really controlling family, then you're going to be really sensitive to controlling inputs out there. Maybe that's going to be more salient to you, even if it's just hinted at, whereas somebody who's come from a more supportive family, what's salient for them are the supportive things that are said to them, and they're not so threatened by control or affected by it. So there are individual differences in the way people will construe their environments, and it's that construal that's going to be the predictor of their uh, motivation. We say it's the functional significance of what they're seeing happening in front of them that, that uh, actually is the proximal variable that causes their, their motivation and style. And so these individual differences are very, very important. Uh, I still go with there's also big main effects. Um, when, a, when a context is controlling, most everybody in it is going to feel controlled. So, um, but within that, there are differences. So I hope that answers your question a lot. Well, I think that's a great question. And Hermina asked, what about people who need power, affirmation, social approval, money, and other materialistic goals? That sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> Are these things that people think they really need, but don't, or are they additional needs? Well, those of you who know self-determination theory, really well know that we postulate there's three basic psychological needs, uh, 
autonomy, competence, and relatedness, and those are the things we see as universal and as functionally important to everybody. Um, there are other things that people need or at least prefer in life that vary by individuals, and the things that you just mentioned, the desires for money, the, I think you said affiliation, affiliation. Yeah. well affiliation is more uh, right. relatedness need, but so power, cool. money, cool. those kinds of things I think uh, show up as individual differences and preferences, and, and the particular ones here, power and money of course, we've looked at those as extrinsic goals. And goals can be autonomously motivated, they can be control motivated, but typically after, after power and money we see those as compensatory uh, motivations or goals that people have, largely because they have deprivations in basic psychological need satisfaction. So the person who really wants power in their life is typically somebody who has struggled with autonomy in their past. And experiments even show that if you satisfy people's autonomy, they become less power oriented. Uh, similarly, the issue of money, you know, we've seen a lot that money's a compensatory you know, need, so to speak, or, or certainly goal or want, that really uh, is associated with more controlling and less related, uh, uh, relatedness-oriented environments in the past. So some of these things are really compensations. They're motives that people yeah. have, but they are compensations, and, and they don't meet their basic psychological needs. So as our research has even shown, even when you attain power or money, that doesn't necessarily satisfy autonomy, competence, and relatedness, which is why those motives, even when attained, don't necessarily uh, produce well-being. And social acceptance, like, you know, we see a lot with social media, needing to get so many likes and all of those things that kind of falls in the same category? Well, I guess so, you know, in, ex in terms of extrinsic goal distinction, we talk about mm -hmm. popularity or right, fame, fame as an extrinsic goal, and if really what you want is to be liked as opposed to uh, be respected or loved in that, in a, in a more fundamental way for who right. you are, I think, then uh, that's probably going to be more extrinsic. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think about affiliation, affiliation is a broad category, only some forms of affiliation are truly relatedness, and those mm -hmm. are the ones where we're really supporting the autonomy of the other. Mm -hmm. so, well, great. That answers your Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that answers your question, Ramona. <laughs> um, okay. We are spontaneously doing we, this thing. We, so. are. <laughs> we, we haven't answered your question. Follow up with an email. <laughs> um, this is an interesting question that comes from Kristen. Um, Sigmund Freud suggested that sex was at the center of everything and is an essential need. But SDT doesn't mention sexual drive in its theory as a need. Hmm. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, self-determination theory is really focused on psychological needs. And, and some people would consider if sex is a need at all, it's a yeah. physical need. Although it doesn't fit the typical uh, drive patterns that some physical needs do. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, many people consider it a drive rather than a, a basic psychological need. But I think our perspective on sex is a little different uh, than some people's. Um, sex is a part of human relationships, and there are many different motivations for sex, and we've actually studied this. Uh, Stephen Jenkins did a dissertation on this in my laboratory, and I know there's been some work out of, uh, I think it's uh, uh, Margot's group in Canada, uh, on motivations for sex. And you see, when you actually ask people, why did you have sex on a particular occasion, some people are doing it because they felt pressured, which is external regulation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are having sex because they think they should, or uh, they feel kind of a self-esteem mm -hmm. issue involved in it, you know, so they, if I don't have sex, I don't feel like I'm good person or something, so introjection can be involved. Uh, sometimes you have a purpose in that by procreation, but sometimes you're just doing it for intrinsic motivation or fun, and, and the motives that underlie yeah. sex are going to color what kind of impact it has. Some kinds of sex will actually fulfill basic psychological needs because it will be done autonomously, and it will bring you into closer relationship with somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, but some will frustrate your basic cycle. Sometimes sex would yeah. frustrate those things because, of course, it doesn't, it might not you to feel closer or might not feel autonomous. Yeah. So sex is complicated as a motive, and so we don't consider it a basic need, but we do consider it something that uh, affects basic psychological needs. That's good. Well, what, so how does something become a basic psychological need then? Well, things What's became basic psychological needs because of evolutionary design, really, that the basic mm -hmm. psychological needs are adaptive. Uh, so it's adaptive for us to want to be connected to other people, to want to be able to not be entrained and to be able to pursue our own goals and values and to want to master uh, the competencies around us. So those things are deeply evolved. Uh, so that's how basic psychological needs yeah. came to be. But we're always experimenting with new needs. You know, right now they're in the literature, uh, Frank Martell and I have been looking at his benevolence and basic psychological need. 
my practice has been... benevolence, being kind, being, being, kind, being caring, caring and giving to giving. other people. Now, my practice is looking at whether morality is a basic need. There are several groups looking at whether novelty and curiosity are basic psychological needs. So we haven't ruled out additional ones, but none come to describe the core of um, what I would call healthy human functioning more than autonomy, confidence, and willingness. So that's why they remain our core focus. So there could be like little mini needs, or <laughs> no, there are, there are preferences, but and there are needs, but there, yeah. they can be needs that aren't universal, universal. basic, sure. cutting across all people. So they wouldn't serve this idea of a basic psychology. Yeah, and I guess that's why I was they, getting they, at it. Situationally specific is, needs, preferences, or wants. Right. So, yeah. that is You're tough as a question. I, 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 <laughs> I'm trying to get to the heart of these uh, questions. Okay. <laughs> that was drill that, away. I know that one was a, that was a, I know. I didn't know you'd be prepared to answer that. <laughs> no, I think you said I think this the issue of what motivates sex is a really important thing. I'd like to see more research that done on SAT. It's been for such an important part of human life and hasn't been researched enough. Yeah. Well, if asked, do you think in general we are our own best judge? of whether our needs are being satisfied or frustrated. Is there a capacity for distortion? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, well, you know, it's, it's the satisfaction of needs is a subjective experience. If I'm not feeling autonomy, there's something in the way am I feeling that sense of agency. If I'm not feeling relatedness, even if other people are doing things that look warm and caring for me, but I'm not feeling, there's still a block in my experience. And we call that distortion. Well, a lot of it has to do with our histories, our learning. As I said before, you know, the families you come from are going to have you perceive the environment somewhat yeah. differently. Whether we call that distortion or whether we call that the psychodynamics of basic mm -hmm. psychological need, that's more the way I would think about it. And when we think about people reporting basic needs, that's a behavior, and the behavior is driven by something. So when they say, I have low autonomy in a situation, there's something at the root of that. So I think in SDT, we pay a lot of attention to people's subjective experience and mm -hmm. we don't consider it just invalid because it doesn't match some operation we did in the environment. There are reasons that people have individual differences in construal, just like Alada asked in that first question that you asked. She, she did, right. right. back to that one. Yeah. yeah, good answer. So Alan, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alan asked, um, here you go, here's another one. Alan asked, is external control needed to achieve internal control. For example, many theories suggest that some level of parental control is needed to help a child become self-regulated. Hmm. Well, again, a really interesting question. I think in SDT, the term control has a specific kind of meaning, that, that you are being controlling as opposed yeah. to autonomy supportive. And in some other theories, term control means that you set guidelines, have rules, have structure. Uh, we use the term structure in SDT mm -hmm. to refer to that because we know that structure can be done in a controlling way. You can set right. those rules or guidelines or regulations in a way that says you do this or else, but it can also be set in an autonomy supportive way. This, these are the rules here, here's the reasons why, here's the alternatives you have, here's my empathy mm -hmm. for why you don't like the rules or do. Yeah. And uh, nonetheless, these are the rules. So we talk about autonomy supportive limit setting. That's really different than being controlling of your child. And this is a hugely functionally important thing because lots of research is showing that controlling parenting is really in the way of internal control, which is what, what this question was about, is how do children develop internal control and self-regulation? Uh, uh, let me see, the, the, the Binrind and others, I think they've been showing that um, autonomy support in the first three years of life is essential to yeah. the development of executive control, which is you know, related to this capacity for self-regulation, delay of gratification, ability to uh, you know, manipulate things in your mind before you do them so that you can control impulses. All those elements of executive control are facilitated not by controlling parenting, but by autonomy supported parenting. So to me, the most important thing is this distinction between structure and control, and the best parenting is high structure, high autonomy support, or mm -hmm. high structure, low control, not high structure, high control. Yeah, and what, give an example of like what that would look like. Because I mean, I have a three-year-old. <laughs> well, so, so, what so you're not, you're not going to let your three-year-old run in the street. And so I guess one question, the extreme, this is the extreme case where you cannot right. let the child do that behavior. Right. So you are right. going to control that behavior. You're going to pick her up and take her 
across the street. One thing you can say, no going in the street anymore, right. and you're going to be punished if I see you. And the other thing is, you know, explaining to her the street's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, here's the place that you can run around. Uh, so you provide her the alternative place to be. You, right. you make clear that the street, the street is not an okay place to run. Mm -hmm. You empathize with, I know you'd like to run out there, but here's the place for running. Uh -huh. um, that's going to help her better internalize the rule than just yelling at her. Because you know what we know about punishment and control is that uh, people will avoid being controlled. That means that they won't do it when you're there. Right. That's <laughs> and really the idea of socialization and internal control is that they do it when you're not there. Right. And this is why it's really important to have an autonomy mm -hmm. support of intervention when you even when you have to exert uh, full control or you have to set limits on right. children's behavior. Uh, so that's a, that's an example, I guess. Yeah, no, I like that. I think I have that problem. She <laughs> wants to take her scooter and like go full force into the street. That's so. right. I'm sure that's true. <laughs> um, we have another question. Uh, this one's coming from Hermina, who uh, she asked, "What can we do if people refuse?" Oh, this might this kind of gets at our our. our uh, again, kind of gets at some of the questions we've asked before, but what can we do if people refuse to start a certain behavior or they're not motivated? Even if you have tried everything to enhance their autonomy, confidence, and relatedness, might it help then to use external pressure to make them start or will they have the same usual negative consequences? Mm. Well, I, I want to be thoughtful about this question because there's several parts to it. <clears throat> and the first part begins with if somebody's absolutely refusing to do something mm -hmm. and uh, they have a reason, yeah. there's, there's, there's something going on for them that's blocking them from doing it. And, and the question kind of implies, well, you've done everything to support autonomy, and competence, and relatedness. I think it said that right. It did. And so if that's the case, I still think you haven't done enough on that because I, th I still think there's some empathic capacity to connect with what's the resistance about. Mm -hmm. And before you can really properly intervene, you know, and need to know what's the basis of the resistance. So mm -hmm. if you really want to overcome resistance, the first thing is to know is what's the basis for the resistance so you can help the person grapple with that. Mm -hmm. uh, usually you're going to find out the resistance more if you empathize uh, with them and try and get that internal frame of reference that's so essential to autonomy support that you'll be able to maybe figure out why they're not doing it. The use of rewards is an attempt to overrun whatever that resistance right. is. It's like, I, okay, you're resistant, but I'm going to overcome that by giving you a reward for doing it. And mm -hmm. um, that can often backfire, uh, actually make, you know, we have a lot of research on cases where it does backfire. I th and I think the intent here is that though, if, I, if there's something I think is going to be really good for my child, for instance, I want to get it moving on it and yeah. they're refusing to do it and there are reasons, maybe they have resistance, we don't think those are good reasons for resistance <laughs> or, or whatever. You know, you still may want to uh, pressure your kid in a particular direction. I, yeah. I first ask myself, do I really, is this something my child really needs to do now? But right. if I thought it was so, um, and I wanted to softly introduce them to them in a controlling way, uh, SDT would advocate what we call a principle of minimal control, mm -hmm. which is if you're gonna try and get somebody into doing something yeah. uh, with a reward, um, use the, the minimum amount of external incentive that you can mm -hmm. because you want to be able to convert that over to internal incentives and you want to be accompanying it by rationale, by value. Um, I think when you do those other things you don't need the reward right. typically. Um, yeah. but, but if you're going to use one, it should be minimal because you don't want the over justification effect. You don't want them to think that the reason they're doing it is only for the reward. So the reward should be more mm -hmm. symbolic, more an appreciative thing. I saw recently for instance there was a a study with kids where they gave them smiley faces mm -hmm. for doing certain uh, healthy food. Oh, I, guess I was going to say this always kind of comes up um, in a health, like in health apps and things I see yeah. all the time, like yeah. you know, in, in work environments where they're trying to get you to be healthy, so they'll give you these little you know, perks and incentives and to kind of get you motivated to move. I, I will say most of those are not effective. Okay, yeah. so the research shows most of those are not effective, but you know, I don't think the smiley faces is a really controlling thing. It's more uh, what we would call informational praise, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's why I think it had a, a positive effect in that particular study, is that it was just a way of saying, yeah, good job. Yeah. Okay, and that's, that's what we say in self-determination theory is a way to motivate people. This is uh, help them feel confident in what they're doing. Right. Um, so we have to be careful about how we use what we call rewards, but if you're going to use them, make a minimal 
and make them informational and be supplying all along the real rationale why you want somebody to do something. Great. That's awesome. Um, By the way, I think people are wrong when they think, oh, it's okay to start with rewards as a way of introducing it and then kids yes. will come to like it. That's not what the evidence shows. Right. Okay, I've heard a few different theorists claim this in the literature. They never back it up with data. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to cite one here. Suzanne Heady has several times said, oh, rewards are fine. That's not what the evidence shows. The evidence shows that they undermine intrinsic interest over time. So if you're going to use them, be aware of the dangers of it. And the people yeah. who kind of flippantly say, oh, no, it's no problem. There's a huge literature that shows when they can uh, actually have and SDTs at the center of that literature. And what are the dangerous effects? Well, that they undermine the sense of autonomy. So they make you focus on the reward rather than the value of the activity itself. So they, in, they, they limit the internalization of the value of the behavior. And of mm -hmm. course, that's what we're trying to do in socialization is um, help internalization, not control from the outside. The problem with rewards is if you if people are doing it for the rewards, you've got to keep the rewards up, and typically you've got to keep increasing the rewards to maintain their behavior over time. And that's not an effective parenting technique. Yeah. So how do you move through that internalization process? Like, how do you get from this a-motivated state or this state well, again, where it's again, you're external? Understand. Again, you're trying to help the person understand either the interest or the value in the activity. Mm -hmm. Help find them a way to get initiated. Make sure that they get positive feedback as they engage it. So don't structure it to be too difficult as they enter into it. Um, right. Again, rationale, supporting their agency throughout, uh, giving them also the warmth and connection so that they can feel secure while they're trying something new. You know, all the things that we think of as basic psychological needs support will help a person take on a new task, internalize it, and, and make it part of their own. And so all of, uh, in, in SDT, because many of you are SDTers, you know that organismic integration theory, that's what the whole theory is about. Right. So I'm going to jump. This is maybe a little repeat of, of what you just said. Uh, but Michael and a few folks have asked about, how do I support autonomy, either at work, or in your personal relationships? And can you give specific examples of how to provide autonomy, confidence, relatedness in those relationships? Well, first of all, these are really broad categories of support. And so, right, so um, we're looking at a work, and let's start with work yeah. environment. Okay, that's what I was gonna say. Okay. Let, me, let me go to one first. <laughs> <laughs> and that sounds yeah, good. No, like if, I, I think, uh, and then, and then even within a work environment, there are many elements to autonomy support. So I just said, uh, and to competence support, and to relating to support, and they're going to vary by situation. But there are some uh -huh. core things. So I'm going to start with the core things, and then I'll give some examples. Great. You know, core in autonomy supportive leadership is understanding the internal frame of reference of your employees. And mm -hmm. that technical phrase means you understand what their experience is. So when you're asking them to do something, or you're... Uh, have something that they're required to do, you, you understand what their perspective is on it. And if you don't know what that is, then you ask about it and you listen to them. So you want the inputs. And autonomy support is really important because listening to people, first of all, you find out what the obstacles are uh, mm -hmm. to their engaging in something. They're also going to feel more empowered, particularly if uh, you're truly interested in their inputs. Um, you may have, they may be able to help co-author the right pathway to engage the thing um, mm -hmm. as, as you as you listen to how they want to go about it. But basically, you're respecting their agency by taking their perspective. You're also letting, you're not micromanaging them, you're allowing them to uh, carry out a task if they have the competency to do it. Um, and uh, when, I, when I say that, I mean you're not, uh, you, you give them the freedom to carry through with the task so that they don't feel like it's always coming from you. Right. So you want to, you know, only surveil to the extent that you need to. You want to give people the empowerment and then give them feedback about how it goes. And so yeah. autonomy support is in part uh, this listening thing, but it's also giving choice, giving agency, not micromanaging, not being controlling. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so just in a workplace thing, let's say that we had a, I have to come up with an example here, but, uh, you know, let's say we had to put together this program for today. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's, we got to get the, the studio together as, as we did. Um, there's, there's lots of ways that you could go about trying to make that happen. Savannah, who's our producer today, right. you know, we could have been, we could have tried to be controlling <laughs> Savannah and said, oh, this is the way that you do it. But instead, right. we said, you know, Savannah, 
set it up and she set it up in her own way we've looked at it but you know she took the initiative I think she must feel if it's working she must feel satisfaction in that uh, but um, you know it's, it's, it's her initiative yeah and I think it's allowing people to feel that sense of ownership and initiative which is what makes work meaningful and, and enjoyable for people I accomplished something at work mm -hmm. today that's a feeling people want to go home with and if you if you micromanage them they don't feel like they accomplished it they feel like they were just a pawn right. to your pressures from the outside. So um, I don't know if that's a concrete enough example, but you know, if any example, there's ways of being more autonomy supportive with the elements of which are empathy. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, providing choice where it's possible, uh, not being controlling. Um, right. All the elements that we specify in these things, and there's ways to design your communications with employees to be really autonomy supportive. Yeah. Um, competence support is if people are struggling in a job, what they don't need is criticism and humiliation. What they need is more structure. Mm -hmm. So if they're struggling to meet goals or can't do those things, then, then uh, I think a manager's job is to find out, well, what's in the way and are there things I can do that can help this person gain the skills or the resources needed right. to accomplish that goal. And that's in conversation, hopefully, with the person themselves. So it's here we would say it's not critical feedback, it's efficacy relevant feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, effectiveness relevant feedback. You're wanting to help the person feel really competent. So feedback is good, but it's got to be feedback about uh, their performance at actually after yeah. their job, not how they are compared to other people. So we, you, know, you don't do social comparison. Instead, you're directly giving feedback about their work and their accomplishments. And mm -hmm. it's really how they're doing relative to themselves rather than how they're doing relative to others because that feels less controlling and more effectiveness relevant. Right. So again, there are many elements to competence support, but those are a couple that come to mind frequently. And then I'll just add, add this third one, which is we have to forget just how important relatedness is in a workplace, and that mm -hmm. uh, you want people to feel like they belong and that they matter in a workplace. And you know, managers can do this pretty easily just by having, conveying a welcome to everybody when they're in the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, showing appreciation for the efforts that they put in, just being happy that they're there yeah. on the job, being warm and. Uh, caring about your employees helps them feel like they matter and then they want to contribute more to the organization so you know it's really the new look in, in work organizations it used to be that how do we motivate people well give them carrots and uh, if they stop being motivated hit them with sticks this was the old motivation was how can we control people from the outside but you know the new look in motivation is how can we support their basic psychological needs so that they feel internally motivated Mm -hmm. to do the best job that they can do in the workplace. And, and I think SDT really has its finger on the pulse of the elements of uh, what's required for that, and that's support for the basic needs. Great. Okay, so now I just need to jump back. Um, uh, Stephen asked, can you discuss mindfulness as a mechanism to improve need satisfaction? Yes. Um, I can. So mindfulness is a big part of the SDT literature now. And first, I want to give credit to Kirk Warren Brown, who helped uh, bring mindfulness directly into the SDT literature. We did some research together very early on in, uh, in uh, the field of mindfulness, really, around the turn of the century, around 2000, where we showed that there was a strong relationship between mindfulness and autonomy, mm -hmm. in particular. That on moments when people are more mindful, they're more autonomous. Um, uh, as uh, that people who as a trait are more mindful are as a trait level more autonomous so there's a, there's a connection both the trait and state levels between mindfulness and autonomy so what is that connection I right. guess now is is what this question really drives at so we get back to the definition of mindfulness uh, mindfulness is uh, is being open and receptive to what is occurring in the present moment right. so it means you know really being aware of what's going on externally and in our external environment, but also what's going on in our internal environment and what we're feeling and what our needs are. And so even from that definition, we can see that awareness is probably essential to making the right choices. I mean, you have to be aware of what the situation is and what's going on internally in order to make choices that are going to be really fitting and congruent with your own interests and values. And so mindfulness is really a facilitator of that because it helps you get the information that's needed in order to make a, a what I would call a more dispassionate decision that really is reflective, that then is going to be uh, likely maximizing of your autonomy. And uh, so I think you know, mindfulness is, that's why we brought it in. I would, I'd expand that a little bit, but mindfulness is often used in a very narrow sense. I would say more generally awareness mm -hmm. is what's really important thing. Let's be yeah. aware of what's going on around us and what's going on internally 
and that's going to help us better make the choices that will meet our basic psychological needs. And just on the opposite side of it, when we make choices that don't fit our needs, it's usually because we are in mindful states. And I'm just going to give an example of this. If you go into shopping malls, what do they have? They have a lot of stimuli, they have noise, they have uh, music playing in the background, lights flashing at you. All those things are designed to take you out of mindfulness so that you will do something impulsive, not reflective, right. and you will buy stuff that you don't need. Uh, as an example, that mindfulness can help you prevent doing that because if you're aware of what's going on in the moment and you go to that moment of purchase, oh, is this a thing I really needed? And you're aware of how you're distracted and then you, you might better reflect on that in that moment and then you make a better purchase, be more satisfied with it. So that's just an example of how mindfulness plays a role even in the micro decisions in everyday life uh, to improve our capacity for autonomous functioning. I think it's easy to kind of get at how it's how we can be unmindful, like you, you were distracted all the time mm -hmm. by phones, by everything that, you know, it's always alarming us or television or whatever it might be. But how, so how do we get to a mindful state? Well, I think one thing is that a lot of us are intentionally avoiding mindful states by distracting ourselves with <laughs> right. social media, by distracting ourselves with TV and doing those kinds of things. And so uh, I think, you know, mindfulness uh, when we think about it, when we think about awareness, awareness isn't, isn't always the most positive thing. Because sometimes right. we're bringing in stuff that we uh, would rather not experience. But experiencing mm -hmm. things helps us make better decisions and, and, and better regulate our lives. So, first of all, people are motivated to stay away from mindfulness <laughs> in, in many ways, and that's it. Yeah. But, you know, I think sometimes it's really important to shut off those devices. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, get rid of the phone. Don't carry it into the conversation you're having. You know, relational conversations are much deeper when people don't have their phones present for them because they're more in this moment and mindful of what's going on. And that makes for a richer interaction between people. Yeah. So uh, that's just an example of that. So, you know, mindfulness, um, I think that's why mindfulness has become so important in the SDT literature because we see this deep tie between really congruent motivation or high quality motivation. kind of a rambling answer, but yeah. hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten some challenging questions. <laughs> they are, they are good, they're good questions. I didn't quite expect I these. know. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's another one for you to, uh, to try to tackle. Um, Ian asked, this is more advice than a question. I have a personal challenge researching SDT constructs with indigenous or minority groups. How can we use SDT tools like questionnaires without perpetuating some of the historical power imbalances between researcher and participant? How can we integrate SDT principles into the data collection creation process? Hmm, I think that's a great question. Um, first, I want to acknowledge the truth that's at the bottom of that question, which is a lot of times, even in the way we go about doing research, we're imposing our worldview on whatever population we're researching. So we go and we have our constructs which we're using to parse reality in some way or another, and those may not be the constructs by which that group parses their own reality. So there are ish ways in which sometimes research itself is, uh, um, is, is controlling or is, is imposing uh, external values. And so I, I agree with the premise of the question. Yeah. And I've been doing research uh, in, since I moved to Australia with uh, indigenous groups in Australia. And of course, they have historically suffered a lot of oppression mm -hmm. in Australia. And they have a historically rich, long standing, and very different culture than Western culture. Mm -hmm. And um, so, as we've been approaching that research, we've tried to adopt what we call a reciprocal research process model. And I wrote a paper on this with Rhonda Craven that's in uh, the Contemporary Educational Psychology with a number of other authors. And in there, what we were uh, arguing is that as we go about doing research with indigenous people, it's not only that we want to see how our constructs predict uh, events within their society or culture, so to speak, but we also want to know, did they have constructs that could help us understand our own society? And so instead of just going in and saying, oh, here's our, here's our constructs, we also try and elicit the constructs that they're using to organize mm -hmm. uh, their understanding of the world, and then researching them. And I think we could learn a lot in Western culture by incorporating indigenous constructs into our research, because we're probably missing them and have blind spots for them. Yeah. Now, if I can just go on a little bit about this, because I think it's a really cool question. Um, in our recent book, 
uh, we had a, a big discussion about uh, cultural psychology and its interface with SDT. SDT is an interesting theory because we posit universals. We mm -hmm. do think there are some constructs that will apply both to Western societies and to indigenous groups uh, across the world because they are universal basic psychological needs. But in saying that, we make the distinction that uh, 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 between emic and edic ideas in cross-cultural work. So the concept of the universality of basic psychological needs is an edic principle because it says this is something that applies to all cultures. Mm -hmm. But we also understand that there's an emic aspect to it, and the emic aspect is it's a culturally specific way in which those needs might be fulfilled. Right. So the way in which relatedness might be fulfilled within one culture might be different from another, mm -hmm. for instance. And uh, Marie Roach uh, from uh, New Zealand some studies recently with Maori leaders in New Zealand and she applied the concepts of autonomy, competence, and relatedness, but she got from them also their perspective on the meaning of those. It's a great, it's a great paper yeah. that's um, out there now as, as an example of this. And you see that all three of those things are central to leadership, but the way even in which autonomy and relatedness are conceived are a bit more in a communal context mm -hmm. and, and you feel the, the different style through which those things are fulfilled. In as you read that research. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important to be sensitive to the emic aspects of how mm -hmm. needs are fulfilled, even though we do see the basic psychological needs as universal. Different cultures will help people find different pathways to those ends or different frustrations uh, for those ends, and that's part of what we would study in SDT. But you know, just back to the indigenous uh, right. uh, work here, I just think uh, I would, I would uh, it was Ian, right? I, I'd suggest to Ian that uh, take a look at um, at the paper by Craven et al. on uh, reciprocal knowledge processes uh, because I think that's a way of the future where uh, we can start being informed by the indigenous psychologies that are also really um, probably uh, providing a lot of wisdom for us that we're missing out on right now. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, I think we have maybe... How are we doing on uh, time? Yeah, I was, was going to ask Savannah about that. Okay, okay, so we have a few more minutes. Okay. Um, um, Here's a question from Alina or Elena. Uh, what happens to basic psychological needs as a result of psychological trauma in a person, especially if exposed to in childhood? Mm. Well, um, so how does, I guess the question is how does trauma affect basic affect, psychological right. needs and, and I guess healthy development more generally, and particularly early childhood trauma. And, uh, you know, as a clinical psychologist, I've had the unfortunate experience of seeing a lot of people who've been traumatized and the uh, sequelae, the, the cons yeah. consequential effects of, of those trauma. And when people have suffered uh, trauma, particularly early childhood trauma, which is often physical or sexual abuse, uh, there's a number of sequelae of, of symptoms that typically result from that. For one thing, once you've been traumatized, you're typically in a state of hypervigilance, so you're, mm -hmm. you're really attuned to possible threats from the environment and in a kind of flight and flight or uh, fight mode, so to right. speak, you're aroused, and that kind of arousal prevents certain kinds of awareness and mindfulness from happening for sure, and also uh, can, can lead to uh, a kind of tension and stress that's really wearing on people. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, uh, dissociation is not an uncommon symptom after trauma, and dissociation is really a way of kind of avoiding or pulling away from things that might be stimulating, uh, re-traumatizing the person. Uh, another thing is avoidance, so there's a lot of avoidance that follows from trauma because you don't want to be back in the re-triggering situations, so mm -hmm. you're trying to avoid those things. So all of these things are potential, um, I guess you could say adaptive or defensive responses to trauma, but unfortunately they interfere with subsequent development in many ways. So avoidance, dissociation, um, those kinds of things are taking you away from uh, opportunities for learning, for uh, the richness that you could probably be getting from relationships, uh, right. from other things that are really helpful in development. So trauma has negative impacts on health and development, and some of that is mediated by basic psychological mm -hmm. needs. I think by, just off the cuff here though, when I think about trauma, I think about the importance of basic psychological needs support in helping people recover from trauma because recovery from trauma means get yourself into a safe atmosphere where you can integrate what has happened to you, but that's only gonna happen in a condition where you feel really safe to do that re-exposure, to do that integrative work. Um, so, you know, to me as a clinician, helping people recover from trauma really means providing them a safe, optimally challenging, 
a secure, supportive atmosphere in which they can then start to address the past trauma and integrate its meaning into their lives and so they can move beyond it. Um, and so I think SDT has a big uh, uh, contribution to make in terms of trauma treatment. Yeah. Um, and there's actually yeah. been some really cool articles that have been written about that, about the importance of psychological need satisfaction uh, in post-traumatic recovery. Um, and that's, you know, people who do recover, they do show this increase in basic psychological needs and evidence also shows that trauma leads to lower basic psychological needs. So um, it's clearly is a big developmental influence. Great. So, yeah. Well, as, um, if, as just kind of a last kind of summer, you know, summary of all these things, um, you know, you work in several different places around the world. You visit different labs, you're in Australia part-time, you're in Rochester part-time, and um, what are you seeing out there in the world of SDT research and application and practice that are kind of the new, you know, the new kind of things that are, are interesting or are new and novel that... Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a big question. It is. Because, <laughs> yeah. because you know, since, with a big since, since you know you, you work all the time on the website, you know just how much, uh, how many publications, how many yeah. projects, how many interventions are going on that are SDT based, how many schools, how many businesses right. are using SDT around the world. So, I mean, there's so many, I think, really good things happening out of the uh, intellectual base of SDT uh, right. in terms of uh, practical interventions around the world um, that um, it'd be hard to summarize them here. Anybody who was just at the uh, SDT seven in uh, in Egmont Hanse uh, would know there's there's all these new initiatives out there. I was so excited and so inspired by seeing all the, the new work that's going on out there. I'm just going to mention a couple of things that do come to mind. However, I, I've been really uh, impressed by um, the interventions in education um, uh -huh. that, that uh, help teachers train to be more autonomy supportive. Uh, John Marshall Reeve has designed a lot of those things and they've been showing effectiveness. I think uh, the Belgian group of Bat Sonens and uh, Martin van Stinkisch and uh, Natalie Alterman and others have been really doing some beautiful work on the circumplex model um, um, that, uh, that shows the importance of autonomy, support, and structure within classrooms and they're doing teacher trainings to match those things. Mm -hmm. Um, we've seen autonomy supportive interventions in workplaces that have been really effective and uh, Mary Roach who I just mentioned earlier I saw that she was on a paper on uh, autonomy supportive training for workers who are not in high level jobs because mm. it's really important to have autonomy in, in every job yeah. uh, and she's she developed a training program for uh, supervisors of those kinds of workers I found that pretty exciting that was just this yeah, week I saw that for the first time so I, and I think any week you can open up the literature on SDT and find exciting new interventions and that's one of the reasons of course why we try and keep the website right up to date so people Thank can find you, the, uh, <laughs> the, the latest uh, on, on, uh, on what's going on in SDT and that's a hard job because uh, it's a massive literature uh, we get all the alerts we can and put them up but it's it hard is. to keep up it is well it's part of the mission of CSDT and I think uh, part of what we're doing today is trying to disseminate some of that in different ways. So are there ways, I mean, we're always open to hearing from anyone out there on ways we can get more research, more application to you, um, you know. Well, so you know, I think one of the things that we've been trying to do at the Center for Self-Determination Theory is find new ways to reach out, find new ways to disseminate SDT. That's really our mission at SDT is to uh, disseminate both the basic science as well as the practical techniques that come from the theory. So we recently, as you know, uh, you, you redesigned the website. Um, I think it's it's coming along really well. I, mean, I know you got more to go and we're going to have yeah, many new features new coming things. in. Yeah, we've got a lot of and new things coming in. It's just this little experiment today. I know this has been an informal conversation that we're doing on the air, but you know, we're just trying this out. We're trying this out on our, our SDT Facebook platform because we want to yeah. see how it goes. Right. So we'll be interested in your feedback. Is this the kind of thing you'd like to see more of? Is there something else you'd like to see uh, on our platforms or in our website? Uh, we'd like to hear all those ideas. So, if you, since you're on Facebook now, if you have some input about this or some feedback you'd like to give us or some future events you'd like to see, message us on Facebook, and we'll yeah. uh, we're we're obviously interested in all those inputs because we want to keep improving everything we do at the Center for Self Determination. And if you don't mind me just making this little pitch, no, you, know, you could you could always help that uh, that uh, movement of Center for Self Determination Theory by donating if you can. Uh, we're really trying to build our resources and make a high quality uh, outlet for things. So 
uh, when you get to the SDT website, you see that donate button, and if you're in a position to do so, help us out. Uh, but I hope we do more programs like I, this today. I hope this, this one's fun. been edifying. This was people. fun. We hope you think we hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, obviously, we can do other things too. We can put on specific uh, content programs or talk about specific topics. But uh, we thought we'd take a shot at it. Today. So mm -hmm. thanks, Shannon, for oh, no, well, questions and, and, and say Savannah. thanks in Savannah for producing this today. Yeah. And immersive uh, for That's supplying fine. equipment Supply and, and equipment exactly. for, for the filming today. Exactly. Uh, excellent. And thank you for all your answers. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Thanks.